previous videos, we revisited some cool British singles released during the second half of 1967. Now, it's time to go back to January. And for the next few months, we'll revisit some cool British singles released during the first half of 1967. So, without further ado, here are some great singles from January. January 1967 saw the release of this excellent double A-side single by The Stones, featuring the songs Let's Spend the Night Together and Ruby Tuesday. The album Between the Buttons was also released that month. Let's Spend the Night Together caused some controversy in the national newspapers due to its supposedly suggestive lyrics. On the other side of the Atlantic, several US radio stations banned the song and chose to play the other side instead. Your dreams before they slip away. Ruby Tuesday reached number one in the States, while Let's Spend the Night Together stalled at number 28 according to Cashbox. Derek Taylor, who later worked as a press officer for the Beatles, was leaving in Los Angeles at the time and he wrote a weekly column for Disc Magazine. Derek Taylor wrote, Ruby Tuesday, is the Stones hit here. Let's spend the night together, your A-side, is lost somewhere in the gloomy wasteland of the bottom 30s. Next week, it will vanish forever, latest victim of the humbug of record banning. It's very sad and very funny and very sick and very vomitsworthy, that in the most materially advanced and educated of all possible nations, a trivial pop song should be removed from the airwaves because of a fragment of hard reality in the lyric line. The banners of records take their meals from topless waitresses, and they grab their recreation in strip clubs. Ban, deplore, hide, punish, stop, stop, stop. All any of it does, is to rip the threadbare shroud of hypocrisy away from the corpse of the sophisticated adult. Later that month, on their Ed Sullivan show appearance, the Stones were initially refused permission to perform the song. A compromise was reached to substitute the words to let's spend some time together. Jagger agreed to change the lyrics but rolled his eyes at the television cameras while singing them. The single got great reviews in the press. Record Mirror wrote, And everybody wonders if this one will get to number one. In fact, it should. And easily. Top value comes from Spend the Night, which could have a fairly innocent air to it if it wasn't by the Stones. Slightly submerged Mick over a vocal harmony, sturdy drive, and a highly commercial yet musicianly approach. The flip is a moody sort of slow ballad. Good contrast, good value. The single reached number three on the UK singles chart. Another excellent single released that month was I'm a Man by the Spencer Davis Group. Journalist Penny Valentine reviewed the single for Disc Magazine. Penny Valentine wrote, this group have now so firmly established themselves both in the clubs and the charts, that they cannot fail with this record. A striking noisy piece which sounds as though someone suggested writing background music for a film on the Industrial Revolution. I won't say it knocks me out like their last record because it does not. But it does grow on you. It's great to dance to, and it will be a gigantic hit. So, I'm sure they're not worried. Disc Magazine asked Mick Jagger about the song. Jagger said, I spent a whole week just listening to that organ phrase on the new Spencer Davis. The record as a whole is not quite as good as his last, which was tremendous. But this will do the top five. Both Keith Richards and Brian Jones also praised the single in the press. Not surprisingly, Jimmy Miller, who produced the single, started working as the Stones producer in 1968, an association which lasted until 1973. The single reached number 9 in the UK and number 10 in the States. The Addicted Man by The Game caused quite a bit of controversy when it was originally released. The controversy prompted EMI to withdraw the single a few days after it was released. The Game were five teenagers from Mitcham, Surrey, who were very influenced by the mod sounds of bands like The Creation or The Who. Derek Johnson reviewed the single for Record Mirror. The lyrics won't please everyone. Otherwise, it's a fairly pedantic sort of group sound with good instrumental splashes. Rather advanced musically. But why was the single controversial? 
And what was it that prompted EMI to withdraw the single from release? The New Musical Express reported, Last Saturday, seven minutes were cut from BBC One's Jukebox Jury. The show, pre-recorded the previous weekend, included a lengthy discussion on the game's recording of an addicted man, until on reflection, the corporation decided it was unsuitable for transmission. Good evening and welcome once again to another session of Jukebox Jury. The show, featured an all-DJ panel consisting of Peter Murray, Alan Freeman, Simon D, and Jimmy Savile. Pete Murray commented that it was one of the most disgusting songs he'd ever heard. Disc Magazine reported, EMI Records have withdrawn the addicted man by the game, following protests by Jukebox Jury and the National Association on Drug Addiction. An EMI spokesman said that although they believed the record was an anti-drug addiction song, they had withdrawn it so as not to cause offence. But a few records already in the shops would not be called in. The fact that only a few copies of the record were released, explains why the single has become a highly sought-after collector's item. In recent years, copies of the single have exchanged hands on eBay or Discogs for more than a thousand pounds. The B-side was another song very much in the style of the top side. Due to EMI withdrawing the record from release, the single obviously went nowhere. However, the early 80s saw the release of several compilations featuring obscure British singles from the 60s. And both sides of this single were featured on compilations from that era, resulting in a whole new generation of lovers of 60s music discovering these two gems, and realizing that just like many other singles from the 60s, the sound was strikingly similar to the punk sounds of the late 70s. Vocalist Paul Jones left Manfred Mann in late 1966 to start a solo career. Paul Jones was the most popular member of the group, and many fans and journalists thought this could seriously harm Manfred Mann's possibilities of future success. Paul Jones' first couple of singles were both top 10 hits in the UK, and everything seemed to indicate that he could become a major solo star in Britain. In the end, however, he was less successful without the band than they were with his replacement Mike Dabo. I've Been a Bad Bad Boy was Paul Jones' second solo single, and it reached number five in the UK. The single was also a top ten hit in Germany and Australia, although it never entered the charts in the States. The song was featured on the film Privilege, directed by Peter Watkins and starring Paul Jones himself along with model Jean Shrimpton. Privilege is a terrifying and withering expose of the misuse of power in an age of illusion. Starring Paul Jones, one of Britain's top pop entertainers, as Stephen Shorter. Gene Shrimpton, international favorite, the face on every major magazine cover the world over. The film's title track, also performed by Paul Jones, was covered by Patti Smith in the late 70s. The single became Paul Jones' last top 10 hit in Britain. Rumble on Mersey Square South by Wimple Winch is another great slice of proto-punk released in January 1967. The band was formed in Liverpool and released three singles for the Fontana label. Record Mirror wrote, A casual storyline type of song with pleasant vocal and a build-up impact. Interesting stuff this, for West Side Story goes Liverpool fans. The group was the house band of a Stockport club called The Sinking Ship, which was owned by their manager Mike Carr. The band was guaranteed one performance per week, use of property for rehearsals, and leaving quarters. However, despite heavy local support, none of their singles managed to chart. A few weeks after the single was released, the sinking ship caught fire and destroyed the group's housing and equipment. And as a result, Fontana decided not to re-sign Wimple Winch. Therefore, Rumble on Mersey Square South became the band's third and final single. Keep it all to yourself, don't tell anyone else what I tell you. The Loop released their first single in January 1967. The band hailed from the same town as the Trogs, and in fact, the guitarist Dave Wright was an early member of the Trogs who left the band just before they moved to London. 
The loot were also managed by Trog's manager Larry Page, and recorded for his Page One record label. Record Mirror reported, The new group from Andover, discovered by Trog maker Larry Page. Larry is convinced that their first release, Baby Come Closer, will hit the charts mainly because of the big bass sounds incorporated. They soon tour with Gene Pitney and the Trogs, which can't be a bad showplace for the outfit. They talk like the Trogs. How can Larry tell them apart? I count them, Larry is alleged to have said. See, there are five loot, and only four Trogs. January 1967 saw the release of the song All Kinds of People. But the highlight of this single by The Fingers was actually the B-side, Circus with a Female Clown. This strangely psychedelic song seemed to predate the sort of whimsical psychedelia that emerged during the second half of 1967. And The Fingers were actually one of the first British groups to label themselves as a psychedelic band. The single was produced by Peter Eden, who produced Donovan's first two albums. Record Mirror wrote, The Fingers are involved in getting their second record all the interest possible. This is being done by The Fingers performing the number on stage, to their own special brand of freakout, which consists of stabbing a tomato ketchup filled teddy bear, until they consider it's dead. If this doesn't result in some loud comment from someone or other, we don't honestly know what will. The single failed to chart. The Remo 4 were formed in Liverpool around the same time as the Beatles, and they were regulars at the Cavern Club. Later in 1963, they signed up with Brian Epstein's NEMS Enterprises. The Remo 4 were also the house band at the Star Club in Hamburg, and they released several records for the Star Club label. But these weren't the only connections they had with the Beatles. In 1967, George Harrison hired the Remo 4 as his backing band for part of his first solo project, the soundtrack album to the movie Wonderwall. Live Like a Lady proved that the Remo 4, unlike many bands from the Mersey Beat era, were able to evolve and move away from that Mersey sound of the early 60s. The song was very influenced by the mod sounds from that period. However, despite being an excellent song, the single failed to chart. The band disbanded in 1970. In 1966, many groups started experimenting with Indian influences, and many bands started featuring sitars and tablas on some of their recordings. This trend continued in 1967. Instead of experimenting with Indian sounds, this single by Tuesday's Children featured the band experimenting with Japanese music. However, the fact that the band appeared in the press wearing these outfits resulted in most people thinking they were just a novelty band and as a consequence, they weren't taken very seriously and the single never charted. This song, however, has become a bit of a cult classic among fans of British psychedelia from the 60s. Yes, In 1964, the Nashville team scored a major hit with the song Tobacco Road. It was a top 10 hit in the UK, and a top 20 hit in the States. And the song became part of the repertoire of hundreds of garage bands from the 60s. That same year, the Nashville teens backed Jerry Lee Lewis, on his Live at the Star Club album, one of the greatest live rock and roll albums ever made. However, the group was never able to replicate the success of Tobacco Road, although they did release some fine singles in the 60s. You're My Woman was an excellent single with a killer fuzz guitar riff that dominated the whole track. The press, however, wasn't too enthusiastic about it. The melody maker wrote, Surely, fuzz box riffs are a trifle dated, aren't they? Especially riffs that sound like Wipeout by the Surf Errors. But there is a nice smashing beat, good old British R&B group vocals, and no nonsense. Mouths have to be fed, HP installments paid, and we hope this will earn money for the group and get them back in the chart. The single didn't chart. I hope you enjoyed this trip back to January 1967. 
Stay tuned for next month's video because February saw the release of one of the key singles from 1967. See you next time.